This is KTRN DB, broadcasting worldwide from Southeast Oklahoma, USA to parts unknown. The new Be Prepared for Christmas package from Sun Ovens contains everything you need to harness the power of the sun for cooking, water, and dehydrating. The perfect gift for the preppers or outdoor enthusiasts on your shopping list. A Sun Oven uses the sun's power to bake, boil, or steam food, heat water for purification or personal hygiene, or solar dehydrate. When you use the sun's power on sunny days, you preserve your fuel storage for rainy days. Sun-baked foods retain moisture, have less shrinkage, and do not burn. Sun-baked roasts are tastier and more succulent, and sun-baked bread has unparalleled taste and texture. The new Be Prepared for Christmas package lets you roast an 18-pound turkey. For the past 26 years, Sun Ovens has been proudly made in the U.S., are durable, and have a long life and come with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Don't be fooled by cheap imitations. For a discount coupon, visit sunoven.com forward slash podcast. That's sunoven.com forward slash podcast. Have you ever wanted to generate your own supply of electrical power, even save money on your electric bill? If so, this is going to be the most important message you will ever hear. Solar power generators are now available. These emergency backup systems provide life-saving electrical power when you need it most. Unlike gas generators, a solar generator runs quietly, emits no fumes, and produces electricity from the sun. It's like having an electric power plant running quietly in your own home. Run some pumps, shortwave radios, computers, and even keep your food from spoiling. Whether it's hurricane ice storms, brownouts, or blackouts, you'll never suffer through painful power outages again. And here's the best news. A remarkable fall truckload sale going on right now that gets you $1,700 in bonuses when you buy a solar generator. To find out why solar generators are the best generators and get $1,700 for doing so, go to falltruckloadsale.com. That's falltruckloadsale.com. Generate your own supply of electricity. Go to falltruckloadsale.com. That's falltruckloadsale.com. Feeling like there are too many pressures and demands on you? Losing sleep, worrying about tests and schoolwork, even on the run because your schedule is just too busy? You may be under too much stress, and it may be affecting your mind. Get your mental edge back with New Tropic Mind Power from MindRegard.com. New Tropic Mind Power is not a drug, but a natural supplement. Its 12 powerful ingredients are natural and non-GMO, plus it's gluten-free, wheat-free, and formulated by Americans for Americans by an NSF-certified laboratory. Nootropic Mind Power is available at mindregard.com, spelled M-I-N-D-R-E-G-A-R-D.com, and comes with a 100% money-back guarantee. Free your mind with Nootropic Mind Power, cognitive supplement from mindregard.com. Mind regard. Clearly see tomorrow and yesterday. Today. And with winter comes dangerous driving conditions. Get your vehicle ready for bad weather by getting it serviced as soon as possible. Prepare for emergencies by packing food, water, warm clothes, and weather appropriate shoes or boots. Don't forget to check the spare to make sure it's usable. Stay informed on bad weather, dangerous driving events by visiting prepperpodcast.com. When Christmas comes, you don't want your family to stare at an empty chair. The truth is out there. Knowledge is power. This is the Prepper Podcast Radio Network.
Hey everybody, here we are together once again for another edition of Survival and Beyond. And I'm your host, Ed Corcoran, here on Natural News Radio and the Prepper Podcast Radio Network. And hey, you know what? I almost forgot about this. This completely slipped my mind. But uh, we've only got about two weeks left before the end of the world. I've been so busy, I, I, I think I completely forgot about that. I thought I, I thought it might be appropriate to talk about it a little bit for the next couple of uh, next couple of shows. Uh, one, I, I almost never talk about this whole December twenty first thing, and I really, I, I don't know anybody else in the in the survival or the preparedness world who really takes any of that seriously. Whatever the um, the popular theory is, and, and it's and it's also fitting uh, in that I was recently. Uh, featured on the, uh, the, the, the the latest uh, survival television program, uh, Countdown to Apocalypse, and <laughs> it's it's quite an amusing story behind that. You know, I got I got contacted uh, last spring, or even before the spring. I think we did this in uh, in March or April, and and I get contacted all the time by uh, television production companies who. Want me to be on their show, and there's there's a uh, really a whole lot of production companies who are um, proposing and pitching uh, survival and doomsday type shows over the last year or so. It, it really started picking up steam. Everybody's familiar with doomsday preppers on uh, on National Geographic, but they, there's a whole miasma of uh, shows that never really got off the ground and. And I could tell you why, because just about every one of them, everyone that contacted me, and I, I've lost count. That's how many there were. Uh, but just about all of them, we're talking, this is going back a year, year and a half, I think. And almost all of them had a, a very similar premise to Doomsday Preppers with with a slight twist uh, here and there. Uh, every every show had their own little signature or, or thumbprint or whatever you want to call it. And, but it was all pretty much based around, hey, let's film you in your house and show us all your preps. And uh, some of them wanted to contrive some kind of phony disaster situation to see how you would react. And and they all, almost all of them had some kind of mysterious experts who would judge your uh, your your level of preparedness or your your level of uh, of skill or whatever. And uh, and and almost all of them, I told them flat out. I said, "You're going to have a hard time finding people to be on this show." And they would always say, "Well, why?" And I was like, "Because, you know, those of us who are preppers and survivalists were concerned about OPSEC, and then I'd have to explain to them what OPSEC meant, uh, <laughs> which is operational security." And uh, they don't want to be on television exposing uh, their their lifestyle, exposing all of their preps and their food storage and everything. And they would invariably, without uh, without variation, they they would always say, "Well, we'll film in such a way so that you can't tell where they live, and uh, we won't disclose their location and everything like that." And I said, "Yeah, do you think their neighbors will know where they live?" Do you think the people who live in the town, in their hometown, will recognize them when they see them on television? Do you think they really want their entire neighborhood showing up at their front door when uh, when disaster strikes, when the shit hits the fan, so to speak? And they were, and they would always say, "Oh, I never thought of it that way." It's like, of course you didn't think of it that way. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. They're not, you know, I, I wouldn't be concerned about somebody in Kalamazoo, Michigan, knowing where I live. I'd be more concerned about, uh, people in my hometown. And I said, and also, uh, you know, these people, they're trying to keep it on the down low, you know, and, uh, and they still, they don't want to be presented as a kook to their neighbors. I mean, they still have to go to their churches, to their PTA meetings, to, you know, they still have to live in their community and just put them on display and uh, they, they, who, who wants who wants uh, to be labeled as the, the neighborhood weirdo, you know. Uh, so that's another aspect of it. So anyway, uh, they would, you know, I'd say, I would love to be on your show, but no, I'm not going to let you into my house. I'm not going to show you all of my stuff. I'm not going to put a target on my head. Basically, and that's the other aspect of it as well, uh, is, you know, you don't want the powers that be 
you know, knowing that you know you don't want to show off your arsenal and uh, and and your and your your preps and everything like that because you know and little even keep keeping firearms out of the equation, we all know what happens after a disaster. You know, if Katrina is any indication that you know they they swoop in and they take everything you've got. They take your food storage. They take uh, what whatever else, and you get labeled a hoarder. And but anyway, there there are several reasons why people don't want to be on these shows. I mean, they uh, shows like Doomsday Preppers. Obviously, they they found people who are willing to do that. Of course, I know a couple of people who are on Doomsday Preppers, and they did not realize that uh, they were going to be portrayed in the way that they were. Um, they the the production people, the producers, and and everybody involved with the show basically, um, you know, kept that on the down low about what they, how they were going to be presented and all that. But almost all of these shows, all of these uh, producers, these production companies, whom I would tell this to that they're going to have a hard time finding people to be on the show, they said, well, you know, um, and I would tell them I'm not interested if that's what you want to do. And they, they said, well, we'll keep you in mind. We'll get back in touch with you later on. And they would always get back in touch with me and say, you know what, you were right. We can't get anybody to be on this show. And I was like, well, I told you. Yeah, I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. And uh, so anyway, I, I turned down a lot of this stuff because um, I I just have no desire for my 15 minutes of fame, as it were. And there are people, and I'm not castigating the people who who are on Doomsday Preppers or who are on these shows. They they all had the best intentions. They all believed that it was going to be a very positive thing, and it turned out to be uh, a very negative thing. And to you know, in in some cases, to a greater degree, more more of a negative thing than for for some people than for others. And so, you know, none none of the people that I know who are on the show got into it because they were they were hungry for the attention or the limelight or you know uh, becoming famous, and and that's not a motivating factor for me. That's that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Uh, you know, it, it used to, used to be that you know being on television used to mean something. You know, being on TV doesn't really mean that much anymore. You know, anybody can be on TV. I mean, geez, look at Jersey Shore for crying out sakes. You know, it's it's not it's not that uh, it doesn't have that luster or appeal. And, uh, you know, of course, there are some people who would say, oh, what are you, crazy? You have a chance to be on TV and think of all the promotional, you know, uh, perks you'll get from that. It's like, well, yeah, that that might be the case, but I'm not going to do it for the wrong reasons. I'm not going to I'm not going to do it just for for the sake of, of that. I'm not going to be pushed around or, you know, made a monkey out of basically um, I, I can do without it. But this one particular show, Countdown to Apocalypse, uh, they didn't want me to do any of that stuff. They said, no, we want you to come on the show as an expert and, and just talk about uh, the situations, that, that uh, you know, survival situations that, that are likely and, and, the, and the things that you need to be thinking about and prepared for. And I thought, well, that's great because that's, you know, that, that's really getting a message across. That's, that's educational and everything. And uh, and so I had to. Uh, they were they were going to come up here up the mountain, and uh, uh, up here in the free state, and they couldn't make it up here. I had to drive down to Massachusetts, and I uh, had a I had a, I I chose the location where we shot, as a matter of fact, because they they weren't familiar with the area. They're from Los Angeles, and they came out here, and so I brought them to a nice wooded area and had a great time as a matter of fact uh was there for like half a day and we shot a lot of footage <laughs> i still haven't seen it i i still haven't seen the show yet because i don't have tv i don't have television uh but one of one of my friends uh who has seen it told me that that my segment was b- about a minute long <laughs> so <laughs> so i'm like uh oh great you know um so went you know went went through all that and they they loved it they 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 were delighted with the uh, with the footage that I gave them because I was very I was very outspoken and I and I talked a lot about um, you know New World Order stuff and and about uh, our our freedom and our liberty and and I was very uh, you know I but had a sense of humor about it and you know it was very I was on I I really was on that day and and I was feeling good I was feeling comfortable I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't freaked out or nervous or anything like that, which I, I 
I thought, you know, there's that thought in the back of my head is like, oh, what if I, what if I freeze up in front of the camera? But I didn't. I was, I was perfectly comfortable and relaxed. But it's a shame. I was very disappointed when I found out that uh, it was only going to be one minute segment. And they also, they also wanted me to, uh, they wanted to film me doing some survival, uh, some survival type stuff. Uh, they weren't very specific about it, uh, so you know, I, I I came up with some things, but we didn't have time to shoot that stuff that day, and so they sent me uh, like a little pocket video camera, like a like a flip camera, um, to uh, and and asked me if I would film the stuff on my own, and and which I did. I I didn't I didn't get it back to them right away because. I'm really busy, and it was really, you know, I, I'm one guy. I had to find some help, uh, find a, a neighbor of mine to help me to, to videotape and all that. And uh, and I, I finally got all the footage done, and I did some, uh, you know, showed how to build a, a water, a improvised water filter out in the field and uh, and covered some uh, some basics about wild edibles, went and uh, some, you know, about foraging, and, and there's plenty of wild edibles around where I live, and so that wasn't, that wasn't too hard, and, uh, but I didn't, I didn't know where to send the camera back to, and they, they were supposed to send me a, 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 a FedEx label to ship it back to, them. I never got it, and I tried contacting them for months and months, and every time I called them, I got a voice message and they never never returned my calls and they never returned my emails and so and I've I've still got the camera as a matter of fact and, and I had actually kind of forgotten about the whole show I found out about this uh from a third party when uh when when that friend of mine uh, sent me an email saying hey I saw you on TV last night I was like really okay well uh that's cool you know um but anyway and and oddly enough and this is the synchronistic part of it the the day before i got that email the production company did finally get in touch with me because they uh were they paid they were going to reimburse me for my my mileage for you know to drive down to massachusetts and do this thing and and i never got the check and uh, you know they called me up and said hey we sent you a check and you never cashed it i was like i never got the check so anyway um hopefully they're going to send me all the footage that they shot and maybe i can do something with the other <laughs> the other 59 minutes or whatever it was that that we filmed uh put it up on my website or up on YouTube or something like that but i i'd still like to see the um the finished product i i will eventually they'll, they'll probably send it to me or give me a link to it or something like that but you know it's like uh one of one of my listeners um uh avid listeners and and she's real supportive of the show barbara harris give a shout out to barbara how you doing uh she said it's a inconsiderate business show business it certainly is once they get what they want from you they basically uh you know <laughs> they just cast you aside and i i i'm sure that i would have never they never called me to tell me you know give me a heads up and say hey all right you're going to be in this episode and it's airing such and such and whatever but you know that's a production company that's not the uh that's not the network. The network doesn't. The network doesn't create the shows. The shows are created by production companies, and they pitch these ideas to the network, and then the network says, "Okay, well, we'll buy that," and then they go out and they create the show. But uh, I, I got contacted by another production company after I had done this thing on the for the uh, the History Channel, and uh, this was for the Weather Channel, <laughs> and this is really hilarious. You probably get a, a kick out of the, this premise if they wanted to. Um, that they were basing the show on, but they wanted to do uh, a show about uh, surviving huge uh, disasters and, of course, weather-related disasters. And, uh, and and I had numerous conversations with these people, like uh, and and for like an hour, an hour and a half, they, I would get a call, and one uh, one of their producers or another, I, I, I talked to several different people, and, and they start throwing these ideas at me. And this is this is why. Well, I'll get to why it's interesting in a second. But they every single one of their scenarios were just uh, extinction level events, things that are just patently unsurvivable like like this one idea that they threw at me this this kid he sounded like a kid anyway he sounded like he was like 
24 years old or something. And, uh, and he's like, well, oh, how about uh, gamma ray burst? You know, like gamma ray burst and it strips off the ozone layer and everything dies because of the radiation. The, you know, with no ozone layer, all the radiation from the sun would kill all the vegetation and kill all the animal life and everything like that. And I said, okay, so how do you survive that? And I was like, you don't. That's what you call an extinction-level event. And uh, he said something like, well, couldn't you, like, wear a hazmat suit or something when you go outside? I'm like, well, yeah, well, what are you going to eat? Everything's dead. Well, uh, you could, like, store food, and, uh, you know, the ozone layer will come back in, like, 20 years. I, I don't know where where he got that figure. I think I think if the ozone layer were completely destroyed, I think it would take longer than 20 years for the for to uh, uh, to to for a new one to form. Um, I, I'm not sure of the mechanics of it. I'm not you know I'm not big on on planetary um, you know geoscience or whatever. And I was like, well, you know, that's an awful lot of food storage. You know, that no, it's impractical. And 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 I think it takes it would take more than a hazmat suit to protect you if you're outside. Um, you know, and and maybe you know, I mean, taken to an extreme, if there was if you had enough money and you had enough people involved, then you you could build an underground habitat uh, like a uh, a biosphere or something. And you'd be protected from the radiation, and maybe you could, you know, grow, you know, crops hydroponically, or or something like that. But that's that's an that's a massive undertaking. There's no way that on an individual level, you know, and this is what they're talking about. They want me to get in front of the camera and tell people, hey, heads up, folks, this is what you do if the ozone layer gets stripped away by a gamma ray burst. You dig a hole in the ground, and you know. And I was like, no, that's just it's, it's completely implausible for a, a single person or a family uh, to have the resources to survive an event like that and be and be self sustaining. And, and and they just kept throwing like all these other well what what if the um what if the uh Yellowstone caldera blows and everything? Again, extinction level event. Well maybe not complete extinction level event, but I mean it, it would pretty much wipe out a lot of life on this continent and uh you know you you would survive that the same way you survive a nuclear explosion you you just don't be there when it happens uh and, and one of the things that i was really pushing for i my suggestion my idea that i thought would be would be great would and something is very very plausible and something that is survivable is well, how about a solar maximum how about uh, a solar flare, and this is this is why it was interesting, and this this touches on how the the media and how uh, and how television is manipulated, um, because well, I'll just go right out, go right ahead and, and uh, say it. They said they were absolutely not interested in doing anything that was solar related, anything that had to do with the solar maximum um, and solar flares. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is an incredibly plausible. I mean, it's a lot more pl plausible. Well, a gamma ray burst is plausible, but there's just no way to prepare for it. You know, if it if it happens, it'll happen. We we won't have time to uh, to do anything about it. But uh, a solar flare is not an extinction level event. It it could throw us back, you know, a couple of centuries technologically. The grid goes down, and and it'll be uh, it'll be a very serious thing. And and it's something that uh, preppers and survivalists are, are conscious of that that we're preparing for. Absolutely not. They wouldn't do what they said. It's not a weather related event. Well, I I don't know why a solar flare is not a weather related event yet a gamma ray burst is. And what I think in in my estimation is that they don't want people being prepared for a solar flare. They don't want people being prepared for the solar maximum, which is uh it, it's it's a very it's a very real threat. We're going into 2013. We're going we're going to be entering a, a phase and, and it's already happening. It's already starting. It's just not in the media. Nobody in the media is, is talking about it. And the weather channel for now, this is my theory. Grant me, allow allow me to uh, wax conspiracy theorist for a little bit. Uh, but but my my theory is is that the Weather Channel just doesn't doesn't want uh, any information going out about a possible solar maximum, and 
they they just flatly refused to even entertain the idea, and then they just kept throwing more and more. What about a rogue planet? <laughs> oh, rogue! Whatever happened to Planet X anyway? I, I mean, a year ago, a couple of years ago, all you could hear every time you turned around, you're hearing about Planet X and and all the videos on YouTube and everything like that. And you know, it's really funny. Um, I had a I, I have a neighbor, and uh, this this is a an observation that I've that I've made when uh, about the number of people who are awake is increasing, and especially uh, I think since I've been putting out this energy about consciousness and about reality and about manifesting and about the the truth, the the truth about the the world we live in and the, and the real um, the real power that we have. When you start putting that energy out there, instead of like most of the time, you know, it's like this is my personal, be- these are my personal beliefs, this is my personal philosophy, and, and you know, I keep it to myself. I don't beat people over the head with it. I don't, you know, but since I've been talking about it more, especially on the show, more and more people have been coming up to me just out of nowhere uh, talking about these things, and uh, they don't listen to my show or. Or really know me, or know what my personal beliefs and my philosophies, what my my personal truth is, and I think that just shows that there's there is something going on here. There there seems to be um, uh, an awakening on on more than just a level of say like you know sheeple starting to wake up to what's going on in the world and going and realizing uh, that there is a police state a slave state going on here it, it, it's on a, a more um on a higher level of consciousness and and more on on a spiritual level and an understanding and you can tell when people get it you know you you can't you can't fake that i mean i used to be in that place where i was like oh yeah well you know that sounds interesting and everything it was more like an intellectual uh, exercise and, and you know more of a cerebral toy to knock around in my head and 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 think about and be interested in. But it's once you get it, once once that light goes on and and it just clicks and you understand it and your all the pieces just fall into place and your uh, your reality will reconfigure itself to reflect that. You know things start becoming possible and you just know it. But I, I want to talk about this some more, but we've got to take a, a, a quick break, uh, give out some sponsor love, and uh, help out the folks who help keep this show going. So just hang tight, and we'll be right back. Charlie McGrath of Wide Awake News here with an important message from Chris, Phil, Russ, Tyler, and the rest of the folks at BuyEmergencyFoods.com. Do not wait until it's too late to be prepared for disaster. The world's a crazy place. Ever-present threat of man-made political and economic crisis makes it important to be prepared. But when you factor in natural disasters, it goes from being important to being mandatory. 7.7 earthquake in Canada, 6.5 earthquake in Central America, and over 50 million Americans affected by Hurricane Sandy, all in the span of just a few days. Make Legacy Premium freeze-dried storable food part of your preparedness plan today. Legacy Premium tastes great, has a 25-year shelf life, and is the only certified non-GMO freeze-dried storable food in the business. I recommend the 360 serving package. That's 120 days worth of life sustaining calories for about a buck 25 a serving. Please call them at 888-543-7345. Again, 888-543-7345 or better yet, visit them online at buyemergencyfoods.com. Silver has been in use as an effective antimicrobial for thousands of years, and this old technology is still in use today. In 2001, a patent was approved for a new medical silver application, nanocatalytic silver hydrosols. Unlike conventional colloidal silver products, some of the advantages of nano silver include up to 300% greater bioavailability, proven non-toxicity in over 25 university and FDA-approved laboratory studies, and extreme stability with a shelf life of over 10 years. 
Guaranteed. With just one product, you can replace all the antibiotics, wound and burn dressings, and water purification products in your medical bug out bag. These products have been patented for use against some of the deadliest pathogens known. Many that are resistant to traditional antibiotics, yet are safe and gentle enough for treating a baby's diaper rash. To learn more about this medical silver breakthrough and see the published scientific studies, visit www.lifesilver.com. All orders ship within 24 hours with deep discounts and free shipping for case orders. That's www.lifesilver.com. Survival is not about the end of the world. It's not about a hypothetical plane crash or the latest violent storm. Survival is about the satisfaction of knowing you can take care of yourself and your family in any situation, anytime, anywhere. CampingSurvival.com was started in 1956. No, not the dot-com part, the survival part. CampingSurvival.com has over 17,000 urban, wilderness, and preparedness items. Supreme customer service, very low shipping, and no games. We look around to make sure we have the lowest prices. And CampingSurvival.com is 100% USMC veteran-owned. Don't base your survival on the latest spring up on the internet company. Do business with an authority on survival. CampingSurvival.com. Confidence born on preparation. Okay, and we're back here at Survival and Beyond. And remember, you can still get 5% off all your purchases at CampingSurvival.com just by entering the coupon code SBRADIO. And Tom and all the folks at Camping Survival, they're, they're great people out there. They're big supporters of the show. So head on over and check them out and get your 5% off at CampingSurvival.com. So anyway, yeah, getting back to uh, what I was talking about before the break, it, it just seems like more and more people are just coming up uh, with, in conversation, just bringing up these issues, bringing up these topics, and and just out of nowhere, you know. And uh, and and like I said, it's it, no predication to it, no prompting. Just you know, it's just it, it's like people are just blurting this stuff out. And that leads me to believe, and I want to believe this, I, I want to believe that there is some truth to the idea that um, there's, a, there's an enlightenment going on, there's, a, there's a, a, an elevation of consciousness, uh, people are becoming, uh, raising, their, raising their vibration, raising their frequency, and since we are all connected we're all interconnected on an atomic level and you know we're all communicating with each other I, I i believe that there there is information we are receiving receiving and sending information on an unconscious level all the time and we're just not aware of it so so if we are interconnected then there's a cascade effect going on you know when the more people uh who learn this the you know the more uh it, it it gets passed around now i don't think that everybody is functioning on this level although i i do have a theory that there there are probably people who have never investigated this stuff never really thought much about it but yet they find themselves starting to think about it you know without uh have, you know like not everybody i've uh, I, I've read about this kind of stuff uh, for a while, for most of my life, really. But it was always, you know, like I said before, it was always just an intellectual exercise. It was, it was always just, you know, some, uh, just kind of like a, a, a cerebral toy that you know I would roll around and and, and play with uh, for fun. But it wasn't anything that I really integrated into my. Uh, belief system, or it, it, it's not even a belief system. It's just you know when, when that light goes on, and and, and something just clicks, and then all the pieces start to fall into place, and your reality will respond accordingly. You know, you, your your reality will rearrange itself to uh, suit your. Uh, suit, suit your beliefs to suit your, uh, you know, your reality shaped by your beliefs. And so, when when those pieces start falling together, it's just like, yeah, it's it's very intuitive. It's not something that you know, it, it doesn't require, 
it doesn't require you to intellectualize it or to um, to to look at it on an academic level. I, I guess that's the word I was looking for. It's like for me, it was always an academic thing, and I was always trying to figure out. Well, I know these things happen. I know these. You know, this is a phenomenon. This is a real phenomenon. But I always try to figure, well, how does it work? And 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 you know, scratching my head and trying to reconcile that with what my previous beliefs were. You know, and until it clicks, until you just suddenly have this aha moment, this this moment of uh, this epiphanous moment, a moment of revelation, or, or whatever it is, however you want to describe it, you know it when it happens. You know, but until that happens, you're still going to remain tethered to the reality that has been fabricated for you, the reality that we've all been uh, brainwashed into believing and and suppressed and you know forced into and you know told that you know this is what this is what the real world is and this is all there is to it and it's cut and dried and everything else. Uh, you will always remain, as long as it remains just an academic intellectual exercise, you'll still be attached, you'll shackled, if you will. You'll still be a slave to the beliefs and the, and the reality that has been made for you. And that, but when it, when it clicks into place, then all of a sudden you, you just get it. You, know, you, either, you either get it or you don't get it. You're either, on, you're either on the bus or you're not on the bus. And I think a lot of people are just finally getting it. And it's just clicking, and and, they, and maybe they don't even know why, but it's just it's happening. And I, I think this is a is a real thing. Um, I mean, this could also be because I I just see it, or I'm sensitive to it, or you know. Uh, but I, I think it's remarkable that it's just coming up in conversation, and people are just uh, like like my neighbor. You know, like I never thought that I would have that kind of conversation with this guy. Never, never in a million years, and and he was the one who brought it up, and and it was great. It was exhilarating to be like, oh yeah, and you know, going into the quantum physics of it, and going into the you know, the whole thing about the mutually agreed upon hallucination, and how we're all interconnected, and how we have a consciousness. We have a shared, we we have a shared our, our collective uh, consciousness, and we're uh, you know, and I and I just rattled off all of these all of these things that. Maybe in a different situation, I wouldn't be so forthcoming with. I wouldn't be so, you know, I, I don't go around telling people this stuff. I mean, this, well, I, I guess I'm telling like <laughs> several thousand people here on the radio show, uh, but this is a little bit more detached, you know, on a one one level. You know, I, I don't really want to browbeat people over the head with it because I think that when when you're when you're ready for something, then that's when you get it. That's when it comes to you, and and, and not before. And I, and I don't want to go and, and proselytize and, and, you know, and force people into believing it because, like I said, either you can wrap your head around it or you can't. Either it makes sense to you or it doesn't. And um, and it's starting to make sense to, to a lot more people, and I'm starting to wonder if those... Um, if those uh, predictions that there is going to be a, a, an increase in awareness and an increase in consciousness are are actually true, and you know, I used to worry uh, a little bit about um, you know with the whole anxiety about 2012 and you know the presumed end of the world and all of the doomsday prophecies and all that. I, I was a little concerned that if this is something that is um, on the minds of, of enough people and they project this negativity and they project this um, worrying that it might become a self-fulfilling prophecy you know, because you have a, a mass of people putting that energy out there um, that it it would manifest itself. And I'm not sensing that. You know, I, I thought I would be able to sense like, you know, or, or see the anxiety level Increasing as we got closer and closer to the end of 2012 and closer to you know December 21st, and I I don't I don't really see that happening, um, so I'm kind of relieved because I think it, it could have happened. I, I think we we could have created it, uh, and and there's and I'm not saying we don't have anything to worry about. I mean we are still in a very um, dire situation when it comes to the the globalists, the elitists, the Illuminati, the slave system uh, that we're trying to free ourselves from. 
and 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 as far as like you know socialism and you know we still have all of those uh all of those concerns but the way that we are going to solve these problems the way that we are going to free ourselves from the slavery that we've been um imposed into or, or that we've been pressed into uh, for centuries really i mean not just not just in the last 100 years or so not just in America, you know, our our liberty, our freedom, our our sovereign rights as human beings, as spiritual beings, has been suppressed for centuries, and I think this is going to be the breaking point where we finally just free ourselves from that. We come to a realization, and it's has to, it has to happen on a. Um, uh, on, on, a, on a spiritual level, on an understanding of frequency and vibration, on a level of consciousness, a higher, a heightened level of consciousness, because you know, voting ain't gonna do it. Politicians ain't gonna do it. Groups aren't gonna do it. Uh, movements aren't going to do it because all of those things are part of the old paradigm. All of those things are part of the, um, you know, the, the failed system. You know, we've tried these things over and over and over again, and it never works. It's going to be on an individual basis. It's going to be on an individual level. Um, where, well, an ind- a collective individual level, where a, a massive amount of individuals just we we're going to elevate above this, and that's and I think I believe that's that's the only way um, it can truly happen. The only way that we can truly uh, free ourselves and eliminate the slavery that we've been in is to um, is just to transcend it, to transcend it on uh, on a truly meaningful level, you know, on, on a level of true reality. And uh, but you know, it's it's like the the hundredth monkey theory, you know, and, and some people say that this is. Not uh, it's not empirical. It's not uh, scientifically uh, proven. But there's a theory that that goes um, once it supposedly, purportedly, this was a study done of uh, of chimps or monkeys. I, I don't remember. I think it might have been chimps. And um, you know, it was in regards to washing. Um, wa- I think it was washing a coconut or. I think I've heard it a couple of a couple of different scenarios, but but the thing is is when uh, when the monkeys try to do something and and they fail, when, as soon as as soon as, as soon as one of the monkeys figure out how to do it, then all of a sudden that knowledge is just part of the it it, it spreads species wide to groups of monkeys on different islands that are separated from each other who have never seen each other and there's some kind of mechanism at work where that information is just transmitted and then all of a sudden you know once the hundredth monkey is successful and figures it out then all the monkeys know how to do it and uh, some people say that that's that's an apocryphal story or that there's no foundation and you know it's, it's not really been proven um but it is an interesting theory, and I think that happens with humans, um, because I don't I don't think the, I don't think the humans are descendant from monkeys. I don't think we evolved from monkeys, or, or apes. I think humans are apes. <laughs> We're just a different kind of ape, or a different breed. But um, but anyway, I'm transgressing, or not? I'm not transgressing. I'm digressing. Uh, but my neighbor, while we in the midst of this conversation about the true nature of reality and about manifestation and about, uh, I think we even talked about magic, about you know how magic, I, I may have mentioned this on the show before, but magic, all the magic is is taking something that exists solely in your mind and bringing it into the material world. Uh, I, if you're an artist, a musician, a furniture maker, you are creating, you are, or you are practicing magic. You are uh, taking something that, only exists in your imagination and making it real. The process doesn't really the process isn't really that important. But in the in the um, 
in the course of this conversation, he, he brought up the Planet X. And he's like, oh, yeah, whatever happened to Planet X? <laughs> you know, all those all those websites that, that were out there like a year ago uh, hollering about the, you know, Nibiru and the Invisible Planet, well, most of them are gone now. And I was like, yeah, I, d- I know the the whole Planet X deal was kind of a, a red herring for, for me as well. And I, I really didn't give it too much credence Um uh, just like I don't pay, I don't spend too much time on um, uh, on other theories like the the uh, geological pole shift and well, you know that goes that goes into another unsurvivable event. Uh, I'm sure the the Weather Channel or the company that's doing the uh, the show for the weather the Weather Channel might be interested in that, but. Uh, I mean, there ain't a hole. You can't dig a hole deep enough. If that happens, you know, it's it's over. You know, you might as well. I mean, there there are limits to to survivalism. You know, people think that uh, you know survivalists are are like you know are capable of surviving anything, or they're driven to to survive even the most devastating events. And they're just some events that are unsurvivable. You know. Uh, getting hit by a rogue planet is one of them. Uh, gamma ray bursts is another one. Geographical, uh, geological pole shift is is another one. But um, on my old show, I got a lot of emails from listeners who wanted me to cover the the Planet X phenomenon, and they had all these links and oh, you, this is real. This is real, man. You ought to check this out and. Uh, and one particular person was recommended who is supposedly the foremost expert on Planet X. And so I contacted him and got him on the show. And I, I won't mention his name. I won't, I won't say who he is. I don't want to don't want to alienate anybody or uh, you know create any ill will. But um, you know, just I, I thought, all right, finally, you know, I'm gonna get some answers because. You know, I went out and did all this. I saw all the videos on YouTube and you know did all the research and and it, it does it doesn't none of it goes anywhere. Um, you end up with more questions or, or you know unanswered questions than than you started with and and uh, so I thought when I had this guy on the show, it's like all right, finally we're gonna get some really good info. We're gonna get some. Uh, some empirical evidence, some some real you know substantive stuff, you know, and and it was no different than anybody else. He was no different than anybody else. Once you pressed him for um, for proof or for for evidence or anything like that, it was there was a lot of dancing around the subject. There was a lot of uh, changing of the subjects, a lot of exposition and going off on tangents. And so, I'm like, okay, well. I'm done with the whole Planet X thing, and I and I put that thing to bed. And really, um, at that time, I think people were saying that, uh, oh, Planet X is passing Jupiter, and and supposedly it's it's of greater size and mass than the planet Jupiter. And uh, the the prevalent theory turned into, oh, it's not a planet after all; it's a brown dwarf star. It's a rogue, a rogue brown dwarf star, and brown dwarf star don't give off any light and so that's why it's invisible that's why nobody can see it well you know <laughs> there are other ways of detecting massive celestial bodies other than just plain eyeballing them you know they, it, you can detect it on a, on a gravitational scale electromagnetic uh, infrared you know there's all different ways that, there's plenty of different ways to, to detect a huge body careening through uh, even a brown dwarf star careening through the solar system uh, and and what about all of the uh, and, you know like the theory was uh, oh and, and NASA suppressing it and the conspiracy theories and you know I'm I'm not a discounter. Uh, if you listen to my show, you know that I do not discount conspiracy theories, and I and I I cover a lot of them, and and I support a lot of them. Um, the ones that the ones that make sense, the ones that are you know uh, documented. You know that these days, you know you you can. It doesn't take much to have somebody label you conspiracy theorists. All you have to do is present documented evidence, but. Um, yeah, I, I I wasn't dismissing it because uh, because of the conspiracy theory. I was dismissing it because 
All right, that explains NASA and the government suppressing it, but what about the thousands of amateur astronomers out there? You know, uh, there's a great deal of astronomical discoveries that have been made by amateur astronomers, and they've uh, found objects in space that are far smaller and far more distant than what this Planet X uh, uh, deal was supposed to be. Uh, were they all in on the conspiracy, too? Were, were they being... Every single one of them suppressed from coming forward with this information about this giant planet that's supposedly on its way to Earth and it's going to cause the end of the world? No. If it were out there, we would have seen it. And definitely now. You know, it's like, it should be here by now. It should be right on our doorstep. Don't hear anybody talking about it. Now, one of the one of the reasons why I was particularly interested in in uh, the idea of, of Planet X, apart from the fact that you know these kinds of things, they're 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 exciting, they're sexy, they're fun to think about. Um, it's interesting to 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 play around. That's not some a nice uh, nice piece of mind candy. But um, I, I was also uh, very interested when from when I was younger, I was keenly interested in the um, the stories of the ancient Sumerians. And um, and I do think that there's there's possibly some some credence in that in the Anunnaki, uh, Nibiru, the, the the whole stories the, the legend the legend goes that you know Nibiru I mean the Anunnaki were were extraterrestrials and that they uh, they they interfered or they manipulated our uh, our genetics and uh, you know the name. Anunnaki, and it is well documented in the, the Sumerians, uh, in, in uh, the, the cuneiform tablets. You know, they were the inventors of the first written language, and you know, and, this, and the story goes. I mean, this is this is some of the compelling evidence uh, that we we've been manipulated, and the, the reasons. Some of the reasons that I think are pretty substantial are that um, the Sumerians at one point were just primitive hunter-gatherers. You know, um, they, they were no, no technology. And they, and they, they pretty much transformed uh, overnight into civilization builders. So, you know, they, they went from gathering nuts and berries and, and hunting game to uh, you know, being possessed of a high, uh, a high degree of advanced mathematics, uh, they developed the first written language. They had the first school system. They had the first legal system. There, there are so many things that they that they accomplished relatively overnight, and they were the foundation of all of the great civilizations that that came after them: the Egyptians. Uh, the Greek civilization, and, and there's at least I, I read an article once that, uh, called the the uh, 100 firsts of the Sumerian civilization, and there, there are just so many things that they accomplished. I mean, you, you don't you don't go from hunter gatherer to architect. You know, they they had a, a grasp of uh, astronomy. They they knew how many planets there were long before centuries before. Uh, the first telescope was invented, and um, that just doesn't happen at the drop of a hat. So there's there's good reason there's good reason to believe that there's you know, some kind of uh, some kind of engineering going on. You know, and the story goes is that the the Anunnaki came to this planet to uh, extract natural resources. Uh, some say it's uh, mononuclear gold I think they they needed for their atmosphere or, or, or whatever I don't I don't really know uh, the scientific basis for that but why they would need it for their atmosphere but but they came here to extract natural resources and they didn't want to do it themselves it was hard work so they uh, they engineered the the locals, <laughs> the, the natives, and they made them smart enough so that they could understand and solve problems and pretty much work unsupervised and you know build them, build and run the machines and and all this other stuff. Um, but there's a, uh, some other interesting uh, evidence in regards to that as well. Is that it seems once they um, 
once they map the human the human genome, there there's evidence in our genetics that that shows the pos- that it's possible that our that our genetics have been manipulated. Um, first of all, once they map the human genome, people the scientists realize that we only use three percent of our genetic code. Ninety seven percent of it is called junk DNA. It's just genetic gibberish, as Carl Sagan put it. Um, and that that seems uh, that seems highly implausible. One of the theories one of the theories is is that the Anunnaki uh, basically put in uh, a genetic firewall. You know, it's like, well, we want them to be smart enough to do what we want them to do, but we were still pretty much slaves. You want you don't want your slaves being too smart, and so they they you know just put in a lock there so that we couldn't access it. Now, I don't like to believe this theory. I like to believe that um, that DNA, that genetic code, will be activated at a certain point in our in our travels and in in our as we as we raise to a higher level of consciousness, then more and more of that DNA will will become active. And that's really what I believe. But um, it is interesting that, you know, such a large amount of our genetic code is just uh, completely unusable or is not being used right now. And there's other things, too, like it, it appears that our uh, chromosomes, um, that we, we actually should have 28 chromosomes. Well, in comparison to, to chimps, and chimps have 28 chromosomes, we have 26. Two of our chromosomes look like they've been fused together, like they were... They didn't know what what to do with it. It's like, well, we, we only need this much information, so what should we do? Well, I'll just splice them together. Um, you know, that's that's kind of an interesting uh, observation. Uh, the other thing too is we have in our genetic code, uh, it, well, in in the human species, we have about 400 genetic defects. Uh, 28 of them are are more prominent or, you know, are, are more common. Things like spina bifida and uh, Down syndrome and, and, and things like that. And actually, we shouldn't have any. We, we shouldn't have any defects because we haven't, well, we haven't been around long enough for those mutations or, or defects to occur. So, you know, you can take that as well, that... There, you know, we we should basically the idea the idea is is that the you know the Anunnaki or whoever was manipulating with our genetic code you know like they made they made some mistakes they they weren't perfect at it <laughs> and it's like they'd be you know splicing and uh, you know manipulating our genetic code it's like oh well made a mistake and okay well that's not so bad we can let that go and oh made him made another mistake well okay we can we can let that go as well it's not going to be you know prominent it's not so so those are all interesting things those are all interesting um observations that that point towards that we may have been genetically manipulated and um yeah that's, that's something interesting to think about but uh yeah as far as planet planet x uh, smashing into earth or coming flying you know close enough to earth to cause the, the end of the world i i don't think so um you know, I I do I, I I can't help but think that there's other um, there's other life out there, there's other intelligent life out there. I mean, it's in a ostensibly infinite universe. It's unlikely that this is the only abode of intelligent life. If it can truly be said that there is intelligent life here, but uh, we've got to take another quick break and. Uh, Give some, give a shout out to our sponsors. So just uh, stick around, hang tight. And we'll be right back. No one knows what the future holds, whether an unexpected natural disaster or a catastrophe of a more personal nature. You never know when you're going to need to call upon your survival skills and supplies. In order to be fully prepared, we at Dan's Depot believe you need two things in order to get through these uncertain times without fear. Proven gear and top-notch survival training. 
DansDepot.com is not just another storefront selling survival gear. Our staff has been studying, practicing, and teaching survival skills for over four decades. We use and abuse all the gear we sell. So when we recommend survival products, you can be assured that it's the highest quality gear available at the best price. But having the best gear means nothing if you don't know how to use it. That's why we have on-site video instructions to help you choose survival products for any situation. Each week, we produce new training videos and articles that inform, challenge, and better prepare you in all areas of survival, first aid, and self-reliance. Come visit us at DansDepot.com and let our team of survival experts help you get prepared with the knowledge and equipment you need to face these uncertain times with confidence. That's D-A-N-S-D-E-P-O-T dot com. Silver has been in use as an effective antimicrobial for thousands of years, and this old technology is still in use today. In 2001, a patent was approved for a new medical silver application, nanocatalytic silver hydrosols. Unlike conventional colloidal silver products, some of the advantages of nano silver include up to 300% greater bioavailability, proven non-toxicity in over 25 university and FDA-approved laboratory studies, and extreme stability with a shelf life of over 10 years. Guarantee with just one product, you can replace all the antibiotics, wound and burn dressings, and water purification products in your medical bug out bag. These products have been patented for use against some of the deadliest pathogens known, many that are resistant to traditional antibiotics, yet are safe and gentle enough for treating a baby's diaper rash. To learn more about this medical silver breakthrough and see the published scientific studies, visit www.lifesilver.com. All orders ship within 24 hours with deep discounts and free shipping for case orders. That's W www.lifesilver.com Okay, now to move on uh, for something completely different. Um, well, maybe not completely different. Uh, something on a lighter note, maybe, or uh, depending on your uh, perspective, I guess. Uh, I wanted to mention that this ridiculous campaign that's uh, being carried out in my former home state of Massachusetts. This is in Worcester, Massachusetts. Apparently, they have a, um, I guess you would call it a gun buyback program of sorts. Uh, you know, you go and bring them a $400 gun and they give you like 50 bucks or something like that. But this year, they've got a new twist on it. And it's uh, uh, bring in, surrender your gun and get a free flu shot. What? Yeah, you heard me right. Now, how's how's this for a uh, 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 just a, a double a uh, uh, double dose of just insanity for you? Um, this is reported on MSN dot com, and uh, the title of the article is "City Swaps Flu Shots for Guns in Strange Public Safety Event." Yeah, first of all, this has nothing to do with public safety. Uh, it's, it has everything to do with disarming the American people and also promoting the pharmaceutical agenda of poisoning the American people. So, yeah, none of this is any good for you. And, you know, like if two terrible things go great together, then I guess that must have been what they were thinking. Um, but the article, I'll read the article. It's a very brief article. Uh, times are tough right now, and public service need, services need to be combined where there's a natural fit. <laughs> this is a natural fit. Yeah, surrender your your means of protection, and here here's some here's some poison to help depopulate the world. Uh, like uh, like with guns and flu shots, for instance, city officials in Worcester, Mass., have taken advantage of the obvious pairing between deadly weapons and immunizations by offering their residents free flu shots at their annual Goods for Guns event. For the first two Saturdays in December, the Worcester Police Department bizarrely announced health staff will be on hand to administer seasonal vaccinations to sneezy gun owners. Residents can get a flu shot at the exchange whether or not they turn in a gun. Uh, gift certificates of up to $75 are only provided to citizens who turn in a gun. Finally, a place to drop off your Colt 45 and ward off the sniffles all at the same time. Oh, finally. Like, yes, this is, this is exactly what people have been asking for. Finally, we, we can, 
We can surrender our Second Amendment rights and also uh, line up to get some poison injected into our veins. Yeah, this is awesome. But you know what? The best thing about this was I, and I rarely do this. When when I'm online, I read an article. I rarely read the comments uh, that are posted because usually they're they're all asinine, and I just especially on a generic or or like a uh, general site like like MSN and and but I I scrolled down and I was expecting to see um I even left a comment myself I, I I love the comments because it shows that Americans are waking up and I expected to see a bunch of lefty libtard uh nonsense and and I actually posted that I I actually went ahead and this is a, this is talk about things I rarely do I rarely read comments uh, uh attached to articles and and I'm even less frequently make a comment myself but I was just uh so uh just surprised so pleasantly surprised by all of the um all of the the outcry. I didn't see a single person making a comment in support of this, and most of these people are, uh, well, they're they're patriots or libertarian, you know, if not libertarians, I, that that's a label. I and I try to avoid using it, but you know, the, these are people who are uh, who are awake, obviously, um, and I want to find some of the uh, some of the better ones that were here. Um, Nice example of just how stupid the poor need to be in order to remain poor. Not a single gun in the picture that I would that I wouldn't sell for double the cost of a flu shot. And many that will sell for four to five times that. Well, that one wasn't so good, but uh, there, there were some really great statements here. Um, people are out of their minds. It would be a cold day in hell before any of my people gave up their guns for a damn flu shot. Even my sheriff said he'd think about arresting them for insanity. What a bunch of freaks. Want mine? Come and get it. Um, it seems like it seems like some of these comments have been deleted since the last time I was on here. As a matter of fact, because I'm, there are some really good ones. And... Uh, I, I can't seem to, uh, you know, there's all, all the typical ones. Uh, why would I want to drop off my Colt 45? Uh, and not to you pry it from my flu-fevered hands. <laughs> no. Sell me your gun. I'll pay for your shot. Uh, I think I think there's been a little censorship going on here, folks. Because uh, there there are some really uh, insightful uh, comments on here, some real uh, liberty minded. Uh, so they want to un- they want to unarm the citizens and inject them with chemically designed toxins. I have never got a flu shot, and I never will. I do find it ironic that they are targeting gun owners. And what do they plan to do with the guns, really? So these pharmacists and train are trained to know how to check these guns for rounds, turn safeties on, dismantle, store and transport firearms. Hmm. I like the idea of giving me your unwanted guns, and I will give you some hand sanitizer, daily vitamins, and the address of a natural health food store. I'm a single mom and could really use a handgun. <laughs> My single barrel shoddy takes too long to reload. I guarantee that. I guarantee they won't be giving them out uh, to single moms for protection. So they sell the guns, and the money goes to what? I don't get it. It seems just a little weird, but if you're stupid enough to get a flu shot and trade your gun for it, you don't deserve to own a gun. Probably best for you to be unarmed during the Civil War. All right, so so there was one that I, that I recognized from before, but, uh, yeah, I... I could be mistaken. I could be mistaken, but I uh, dumb idea about gun control. Not gun control nuts will do anything to get rid of guns, leaving good people defenseless. That being said, I did trade in a gun at a collection one time. It was a shotgun that had been damaged in a fire and could not find any other way to dispose of it. Well, that that one wasn't uh, so insightful, but yeah, I I might be mistaken, but I think they've deleted some of these. Uh, so, some of the comments that were up here. 
Hmm. Has it really come down to guns for flu shots to where people are trading firearms for medical care? Holy crap. <laughs> but be assu- be reassured we're the, we're on the right track and moving forward. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, trading you let let's uh let's take your guns and we'll give you a shot uh flu shot and uh this whole um flu season, I guess, is the the whole insanity is is happening happening once again, you know, at that time of year, once again, folks, you got to go out and get your poison and uh I'm um, I'm really glad that I finally got through to my family and I I talked to my um, back when the whole uh, flu, the flu swine, the H1N1 uh, hoax was going on, um, I, I got through to my my brothers because I've got I've got nephews and a niece, and uh, I made sure that I filled them both in. I one of my brothers I really didn't have to tell him so much because his uh, pediatrician, the pediatrician that he goes to, is is anti-vaccine and um he doesn't he doesn't recommend it so it didn't really require too much coaxing with uh to convince uh one of my brothers but my other brother he was i i didn't have to convince him i mean he he was just unaware and and i laid it all out for him and in fact this whole, the whole thing started with a uh it started with my mother and i was having a conversation with her and she was saying oh i've been I've been bought, I've been on the, the the boys to to get their bring the kids to get their flu shots and everything. I was like, "What are you insane?" And it turned into an argument because you know, of course, my mom, you know, my, she's my mom, you know, and I love her and everything. But uh, she buys, you know, she buys into the whole media thing, and and uh, she was a hook, line, and sinker. She she uh, bought the whole line on H1N1 and and this all oh, this whole pandemic that never happened and and I I just laid it all out for her about the um the vaccines and the mercury and the squalene and all of the um the how they're linked to uh, autism and and everything like that and my mother's like oh of course not uh, of course they wouldn't say it on television if it wasn't true you know after all and uh and and, and it kind of it kind of turned it was a, well it wasn't an argument uh, it was more like a like a heated debate <laughs> i guess is a better way of describing it and uh and so you know and i was so riled up that you know i went home and i and i just printed out everything that i had uh about the vaccines, and, and I was going to go, the next time I saw her, I was going to go and just drop this ton of information on her, uh, all, all about the truth about vaccines. And somewhere along the line, the, the thought occurred to me, why am I trying to convince her? You know, because she's she doesn't have any kids anymore, and there's no nobody's in danger. You know, uh, there's no child, and and my, my mother's not putting any child in danger of getting uh, getting vaccinated. So I figured, well, you know, the people I should be talking to are my brothers because they do have kids and they are uh, in charge of their their uh, their kids' uh, uh, health and and all that. And so that's what I did. And and my one brother Tom, he he was uh, he, he he was very very enlightened and grateful uh, for the information that I gave him. And my other brother, my other brother John, was like, yeah, I already know about that. My pediatrician is uh, is against it. So so that that was good. So you know, if you're still out there getting your flu shot, man, I've never had a flu shot, and I've never had the flu. Because you know what's in the flu vaccine? The flu. Yup. Along with mercury and and uh and, and squalene and uh insect repellent and <laughs> just uh also there there was uh it was discovered that uh the recent or well the, the, the current rise in um food allergies is related to vaccines as well because they use uh, these food adjuncts, you know, like, like peanut butter allergies, that that's become rampant. I mean, I don't remember when I was a kid even hearing about anybody with a, a food allergy. And, and nowadays, kids can't bring peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to school with them because, oh, somebody might have an allergic reaction. Um, 
and, and the reason why there, there's such an increase in uh, peanut allergies is because the vaccines, they actually use peanut oil as a vehicle in, in the vaccine. And if you inject a food substance into your bloodstream, your immune system will immediately respond to that as uh, as a foreign body, which is what it is, and you instantly develop a uh, an allergy to that. And doctors have known this since like the 19th century. They've known that that's that's the reaction. That's that's what you know that it causes food allergies. You you do not inject food right into your into your veins, into your uh, into your bloodstream, and so that's uh, that's kind of telling. Excuse me, that's kind of telling that um, that this is this is a known reaction, and uh, and this is what's happening. And we are being engineered, um, and well, this is kind of a, an awkward segue, but it was something else I wanted to bring up as well. And um, I have a few minutes left before we have to take a break, and we do have a guest on the show this week. We have Jim Cobb. Our good friend, I've known Jim for a while now, and uh, and he just came out with a book, uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna be talking. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that right now, uh, just just getting off the subject. But um, something that I've been reading about recently, and, and it's not the first time I've heard about it, but I never really looked into it too much. But you know, I talk an awful lot about. Um, about the media and how how we're conditioned, we're conditioned to accept things uh, just by what's portrayed uh, on television, and, and television is just oh well. I think if you listen to my show uh, on any kind of regular basis, you know that I'm I'm completely against uh, the the whole medium of television. Hell, even the inventor of television was anti-television. Um, Philco Farnsworth, he, the inventor of the uh, electronic television, uh, wouldn't even allow it in his house. He wouldn't allow his kids to watch it. Uh, he said that he would not. Uh, his the television would have no part of his children's intellectual diet, as he put it. And you know, once he saw what um, what television turned into, I mean, TV was invented back in the 30s. Uh, or no, it was actually invented back in the 20s. Farnsworth actually came up with the idea for television, uh, drew out the schematics and everything when he was like 12 years old. He was a, a prodigy. And um, once he saw what it was being used for, I, you know, like so what I'm saying is TV was, TV was around for a while, and nobody really saw any kind of, commercial viability for it. It's like, okay, well, you've got this box that can show moving pictures um, and and receive transmissions. What do you do with it? And when and, and last week when I was talking about the, the origins of media control and how all of this came to be, our media has always been controlled. It, it's not something that's a, a late 20th century, early 21st century phenomenon. This, this has been going on since they were since the birth of media, since radio, um, even since before radio, and, and there's been uh, just a, a conspiracy, a, a corporate conspiracy um, that that brought you know the Rockefeller Foundation brought about um, the RCA and NBC and all the broadcasting companies and and the Federal Reserve has dictated to the broadcasting companies what they can broadcast and by threatening uh, to call in their loans if they didn't uh, if they didn't say and and perpetrate the propaganda that they wanted them to perp- perpetrate or propagate so there's always been media control since the very very beginning and what's uh what's being what's showing up on the radar right now is uh this whole and this is this is an illuminati this is an elitist um agenda uh i guess is as good a word as any for it uh this whole transhuman movement that's kind of been um 
infiltrating pop culture or pop music, um, you know, like Lady Gaga, and, and and these are all I'm I, I'm totally unfamiliar with most of pop music. I really can't stand much of it. Uh, so I'm I these are not people that I. I, I would be aware of or, or have seen, but um, I've been reading a lot about you know Lady Gaga and Black Eyed Peas and um, Beyonce. Uh, the, their, their, their videos and their stage performances are very um, very heavily influenced or very heavily promote this this transhuman. Um, I don't even know what to call it. The, you know, this, the, this whole movement, really, and, and what it is is this is something that's born from the you know, uh, it's a very technocratic, um, utopian. You know, if you're a technocrat, uh, ideal that the human that human evolution has kind of reached a uh, reached a, a, a brick wall or a dead end. And it's all of this science that involves incorporating, um, incorporating well, machines, uh, electronics, uh, chips, and whatnot. And ostensibly, the purpose of this is to is for uh, supposedly to benefit the human race and extend our lifespan and increase our intelligence and our and our physical capabilities and and all this other stuff and it's basically like if you're if you're a star trek fan like i am it's basically you know there there are people out there who want to to turn the human race into the borg you know uh implanting chips in in the brain and and there are some positive um applications for this this whole movement you know, for example, like for prosthetic, prosthetic hands and limbs for people who have lost their, you know, lost an arm or or for our implants that allow uh, blind people to have some kind of vision or for deaf people to you know to restore some kind of hearing and everything and and those are all good humanitarian applications for it but it goes beyond that until you get to into this dystopian kind of i mean it, to me it sounds like a nightmare i mean it goes some of it goes so far as to um uh, there are people who are endeavoring to transfer consciousness into a computer in some kind of pseudo spiritual quest for you know freeing yourself from the the, the physical world and um and, and that that direction just seems completely backwards and just wrong thinking i mean if you are well first of all you know as far as extending life goes you know I, I don't understand the quest for physical immortality. I I just don't get it, you know. And some people might see a contradiction in that, uh, you know, as being a survivalist, that you're you you would think that I would be you know interested in living for as long as possible. Well, no, this is this is only meant to be a temporary existence, you know. I understand that I'm part of something that's universal, something that is. It goes way beyond what this the limitations of this life are. Does that mean that I want my physical life to end any sooner? No. You know, I I would like to enjoy the ride for as long as possible, and I'm certainly not going to let anybody else uh, decide when that ride is going to end for me. Uh, however, I have absolutely no interest in living forever. I'm quite looking forward to returning to the uh, or reintegrating in, into the you know the, uh, the the rest of reality, the true reality, the you know in, into the universe, returning to a spiritual state. I'm quite looking forward to it. I, I don't. Uh, I, I think that that would be you know to be stuck in this plane of existence that sounds like madness to me but there are some people who think that you know that is the ult- that should be the ultimate goal is to uh is to live forever live forever 
trapped in this physical machine that we occupy. You know, you don't, uh, like, like I like to say, you know, you don't have a soul, you have a body. You are a soul. And, um, but for some people, this is, this, uh, possibility is very attractive to them. Uh, and a lot of people are getting excited about it, about, you know, augmenting the, uh, augmenting human capabilities and augmenting intelligence. And, you know, and this is, um, it, a lot of people who are proponents of this, you know, they cite Moore's Law, which according to Moore's Law is that um, technology uh, has, technology increases exponentially like every six months or every year. I, I don't know if that's if that's absolutely true. Well, I kind of think that's true uh, to a certain point, but, and, and I'll make that, I'll make that point in a second. The, all those people, those all those regular folks, you know, if you're, I mean, you know, was, in terms of like if you're a science fiction geek, then this might sound kind of exciting and integrating yourself with with computers and everything like that, but um, and, and the extension of life and everything. But the thing that most people fail to realize is that all of these beneficial things that might possibly come from this, uh, it's not meant for you or me. It's meant for the elites, you know. It's uh, the 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 only the only trickle down that we're going to get are the chips that will control us. We're not going to get the technology that's going to improve our lives. And and frankly, I don't want that. I don't I don't I don't want to be a, a cyborg, you know. Uh, there's other applications as well. I mean, with nanotechnology. Um, there, there's a great drive and uh, a lot of research being done in creating uh, microscopic machines that can build other machines on an atomic level, and you uh, inject them into your bloodstream, and it basically augments your immune system, and, and that means the end of disease and cancer and all this other, you know, stuff, right? It's, it's all going in the wrong direction, Okay. Um, you know, you you do not endeavor to have a spiritual experience by transferring your consciousness into a computer. Okay, you do not endeavor to cure diseases by injecting nanobots into your bloodstream. You can do these things already. We have the capability to to rid ourselves of sickness and. Um, and and it's all about you know it, it again it comes down to frequency it comes down to vibration you know all you have to do and um, I don't remember who said it but all you have to do is match the vibration of the reality that you want and it will be created and you can heal yourself you you can have a spiritual experience without transferring your consciousness from your physical brain into a computer. And besides which, uh, how, how could you trust that? I mean, for all we know, we're probably already living inside a computer. There's no way that you can disprove it. You know, this, there could, you know, the matrix could be real. And I mean, the matrix in the um, literal sense, uh, you know, as portrayed in the movie uh, or movies. Um, but, I why would I wouldn't volunteer I wouldn't volunteer to have my consciousness transferred into a machine because there's people on the outside who are going to be controlling that machine and uh, I you know how can how can, how can you trust uh, how, how can you trust whoever is running the machine you know in search in search of an artificial spiritual experience you know you're going to have a real spiritual experience when you pass from this material world. So so this is what I don't get about the elites want the elites want to live forever and in pers- in pursuit of well physical and intellectual perfection and in pursuit of uh, a spiritual experience and that that it's just the wrong way of going about it. It's already it's already possible to do that if you get in touch with re- what reality is all about and your spiritual awareness and and your true consciousness. 
you don't need machines for that. But I think the main thing is it's really about um, it's really about control, and this is where the whole uh, pop culture comes in. And, and I've done a lot of research in terms of um, mind control in the music industry and monarch um, programming. You know all this MK Ultra stuff that, uh, and, and you hear people who were victims of this. I mean this. This stuff is happening. This stuff does happen. Um, the, when you're when you're in the entertainment business, the stuff that you don't see behind the scenes is that you, you're you're a slave. You're 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 a commodity. You know, and the the industry, the corporations known as the music industry, they own you. And um, there's there's lots of evidence. Of uh, of programming going on, and you know the whole MK Ultra thing, where they use uh, torture to make you disassociate um, from you know make your consciousness and and you disassociate from your uh, body, and you end up as a defense mechanism, compartmentalizing, and they can create a um, an alternate personality. You know, and this this is all documented fact. I mean, the, all of these all of these documents are are uh, declassified by now, or or you can obtain them through a Freedom of Information Act. But I, there's really no need to do that because they're you know they're all available. The, this is you know uh, MK Ultra is a real was a real. It, it probably still exists. It, it probably still exists in one form or another. But um, yeah, all these things have been done and. It's been shown that it's, you know, or it's known that it's, it goes on in the music industry where uh, artists or performers, I should say, because I'm not convinced that <laughs> that even half of them are really artists or can be called that, or they qualify as artists. But uh, they've for everything from you know simple brainwashing right right up to this you know monarch uh, mind control techniques have been applied to them and and there's an ins- there's there's been an insurgence of um of this whole uh transhuman uh symbology and um and and imagery and representation being used in the um in the music industry where you know there's it's like the i think the black eyed peas and and the will i am one of the members of that group is like a big proponent of this. I mean, he he talks about it like this is something that should be aspired to. Uh, integration of uh, the biological with the mechanical, and it, it's it's a bad path. I mean, anything from on those of us in the patriot movement and those of us who are awake and are aware of the new world order and what their plans are in regards with. Uh, um, RFID chips, you know, that's that's what we have to look forward to, um, and worse, you know, I mean, the RFID chips so far can only track you, but they have they're developing technology that can be implanted in your brain that will actually control you, and uh, and and make you a compliant slave, and so then so then they don't have to uh, brainwash you and program you through the media and through music and through all this other stuff, and it's actually the 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 performers and the people in the industry who are who are promoting this uh this new agenda of uh, of total control and all that life extending stuff and all that intelligence and and physical augmenting technology well that's never gonna <laughs> you know you're never gonna get any of that stuff and not not that you would want to anyway but uh i i just thought i'd bring that up because that's uh it, it's something that's uh it's kind of new that i've well it's not new but it's new to me and um be interested i'd uh, be interested to hear your thoughts on this all of you who are listening, and if you want to make a comment, um, come and visit survivalandbeyond.net. I, as usual, as I always say, I love to hear from uh, from my listeners, and uh, we got all kinds of stuff. If you haven't been to the website, um, there's 
the news articles, there's survival and preparedness information, there's videos, there's free uh, survival guides to download. But uh, we're going to have to move on right now. Another, we're going to do another commercial break. And, um, oh, yeah, and we're also going to be doing some uh, product giveaways, too. So you have that to look forward to. But we're going to do a commercial break right now. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Jim Cobb, and he's the author of the brand-new book, Prepper's Home Defense. And it's a, it's a great book, and he's going to visit with us briefly and uh, tell us all about it. So just stick around, and we'll be right back. No one knows what the future holds, whether an unexpected natural disaster or a catastrophe of a more personal nature. You never know when you're going to need to call upon your survival skills and supplies. In order to be fully prepared, we at Dan's Depot believe you need two things in order to get through these uncertain times without fear. Proven gear and top-notch survival training. DansDepot.com is not just another storefront selling survival gear. Our staff has been studying, practicing, and teaching survival skills for over four decades. We use and abuse all the gear we sell. So, when we recommend survival products, you can be assured that it's the highest quality gear available at the best price. But having the best gear means nothing if you don't know how to use it. That's why we have on-site video instructions to help you choose survival products for any situation. Each week, we produce new training videos and articles that inform, challenge, and better prepare you in all areas of survival, first aid, and self-reliance. Come visit us at DansDepot.com and let our team of survival experts help you get prepared with the knowledge and equipment you need to face these uncertain times with confidence. That's D-A-N-S-D-E-P-O-T dot com. Silver has been in use as an effective antimicrobial for thousands of years, and this old technology is still in use today. In 2001, a patent was approved for a new medical silver application, nanocatalytic silver hydrosols. Unlike conventional colloidal silver products, some of the advantages of nano silver include up to 300% greater bioavailability, proven non-toxicity in over 25 university and FDA-approved laboratory studies, and extreme stability with a shelf life of over 10 years. Guarantee with just one product, you can replace all the antibiotics, wound and burn dressings, and water purification products in your medical bug out bag. These products have been patented for use against some of the deadliest pathogens known, many that are resistant to traditional antibiotics, yet are safe and gentle enough for treating a baby's diaper rash. To learn more about this medical silver breakthrough and see the published scientific studies, visit www.lifesilver.com. All orders ship within 24 hours with deep discounts and free shipping for case orders. That's W www.lifesilver.com Charlie McGrath here with an important message from Chris, Phil, Russ, Tyler, and the folks at PrepareWise.com. Do not wait until it's too late to be prepared for a disaster. The world's a crazy place. We have the ever-present threat of man-made political and economic crisis making it important to be prepared. But when you factor in natural disasters, it goes from important to mandatory. A 7.7 earthquake in Canada, a 6.5 earthquake in Central America, and over 50 million Americans affected by Hurricane Sandy. It's time to make Legacy Premium freeze-dried storable food part of your preparedness plan. Legacy Premium tastes great, has a 25-year shelf life, and is the only certified non-GMO freeze-dried storable food in the business. I really recommend the 360 serving package. That's 120 days worth of life-sustaining calories for about a buck 25 per serving. Give the guys over at PrepareWise a call at 888-545-6265. Again, 888-545-6265. Or better yet, visit them online at PrepareWise.com. Okay, and we're back, ladies and gentlemen, here on Survival and Beyond. And with us this week is my good friend Jim Cobb, and he runs survivalweekly.com. And he's also the author of the latest uh, Prepper book called Prepper's Home Defense. And, uh, well, let's just welcome him to the show and let him tell us all about it. How you doing, Jim? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing just swell here. Um, and this book, man, I just got it a couple days ago and everything, and it's a uh, it's a really uh, one thing about it is that it's uh, I don't want to say it's unusual, but it's not your typical uh, you know prepper book. It's not full of uh, food storage and water purification and all that kind of typical stuff. This is really dedicated to defending your home in a collapse situation. And uh, why, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about what they're going to find in this book? Well. 
let me begin with this. When I sat down to write the book, I wanted to have uh, the the objective was to give the average person some instruction and some guidance on how best to protect their their family and their assets. We're not all ex Navy SEALs. We're not all ex Green Berets. We don't have we don't necessarily have access to the resources that the military would have. We're, you know, common people with a common need. So one of the things that I really tried to focus on with the book is what the average person could do to dramatically increase their odds of survival during an attack or, you know, a break in things like that. And many of the things in the book are just as applicable today as they would be during or after a collapse. You know, naturally the the concept of deadly force comes into play and in today's society that might have a whole different uh focus than it does after a collapse. So, you know, as you go through the book, there are some things that you really shouldn't do unless there's a total absence of rule of law and you are truly on your own. But many of the things in there, are you can implement them today to help protect your home from a break-in or from an invasion or robbery, anything like that. Right. You know, I, I like one of the things that you said in the book, there that there's – there's plenty of books out there that are just for the general public, you know, non-prepper, non-survivalist uh, type uh, security and home defense type books. But they're all predicated on one principle, and that's that, uh, you, you know, you can expect the the way you put it, uh, uh, officer friendly to show up eventually to help you out. And that's not what you, you can't count on that in a collapse or a SHTF situation. Absolutely. And, you know, that goes back to what I was talking about earlier. You know, when, when there's a collapse and there's a total absence of law, you are truly, totally on your own. There is no 911. There is no officer friendly. You need to handle the problem yourself as best you can. And by following some of the suggestions in the book, you're dramatically increasing your odds of success as opposed to you know, you've got Joe Suburbanite who works in an office 40, 50 hours a week, has absolutely no background when it comes to firearms, when it comes to security, when it comes to military, anything like that. This book's going to help that guy increase his odds. It's going to stack the deck in his favor by knowing what he can do ahead of time and what to do at the time of crisis to be able to fend off invaders, things like that. One of the things that I focus on is if it comes to the point where you are attacked, you failed somewhere along the line as it is. Right. You, you made yourself known, people were aware of you, and now you need to solve that problem. One of the things you want to do is try to avoid that problem happening to begin with by, you know, being very low key, becoming what we call the gray man. You want to blend in. Now, that's not always going to be successful depending on what the collapse is, what, what it's predicated upon, but that's the first step is trying to avoid the problems before they become problems. Sure. And you cover, uh, proactive as well as reactive solutions, uh, OPSEC, you, you go a lot into OPSEC and, and really how to set up your, your home or your, uh, your living area, you know, where you live, the, the vicinity around your house in order to, um, in order to preclude or, or to, to prevent, um, anybody, any looters or, or whoever that would necessarily come out of the woodwork after a collapse. And why don't you tell us a little bit about some of those solutions and what, what you can do as far as, you know, you, you talk about like light discipline and sound discipline and, and all these other things that normally uh, people wouldn't think about. Sure. 
Well, for example, with light discipline. At night, after a collapse, you don't want people to know that you have supplies. You don't want people to know that you're living high off the hog, so to speak, because you thought ahead and you stockpiled your food, your water, and all that stuff. So one of the solutions you can do is, at night, use blackout curtains over your windows to prevent people from noticing that you have lights on inside, whether those be candle, oil lamp, or whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, noise discipline, many of us have kids. Those kids are going to want to be outside. They're not going to want to be cooped up for weeks on end, assuming it's not a pandemic or something like that where, you know, their very safety it requires them to be in quarters. You want to try to keep things quiet. You want to keep things low key. If, for example, your town sets up a, a food aid program of some sort, you know, a soup kitchen type of thing. Personally, I've always felt that if you don't need that aid, don't accept that aid. Leave it for the people that truly need it. However, if your absence in that soup kitchen line will be noticed and people will wonder, well, why isn't Ed always coming down here every day? What, you know, what's he got? Then you might want to step in line and, you know, take what they're offering. Um, other things that I suggest when it comes to OPSEC are, you know, prior to the collapse, you may not realize it, but your neighbors truly do notice what you're doing, just as you notice what your neighbors are doing. And if three or four times a week you're getting huge shipments of anything, you know, it doesn't have to say, you know, MRE on the side of the box, people are going to notice that you're suddenly getting all this stuff or you're coming home from the grocery store once or twice a week with an entire trunk load of groceries and it's just two people that live in the home. They're going to remember that. That's going to stick in their heads later. So you want to avoid being obvious when it comes to getting your shipments of gear and supplies and coming home from the grocery store. You know, for example, if you work in an office environment and it's, you know, you have the ability to do so, have at least some of that stuff shipped to your office and bring it home in your car. Park the car in the, in the garage and, you know, unload it at your leisure. The same with groceries. When you come home, pull it into the garage. Unload your car there. People will be none the wiser. It's not something that would be out of character for people to do. And you don't have those eyes watching it. Every neighborhood has at least one busybody who right. seems to have their finger on the pulse of the neighborhood. They know who's sleeping with who. They know who's broken up, broken up with who. They know who's headed for divorce. They know whose kids are always in trouble. And those are the people that are going to notice, you know, God, in the last month, I bet you UPS has stopped by Ed's house at least 20 times. What's he doing over there? Right. And... You don't want that. You don't want to call attention to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And and likewise, after a collapse, um, one of the concerns is when everybody else is starving and they're eating dirt and they happen to notice that, hey, you don't seem to be doing so bad. You look pretty healthy. You know, that's uh, a, a concern as well. But that's something, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's something that's kind of unavoidable. You know, you're not going to... Um, there's there's no way really to, uh, to to get around that. Now there have been uh, there have been um, suggestions that I've heard where if you live in a in a community and or if you have you know if you're friendly with your neighbors, which is a very rare thing these days, people really don't have relationships with their neighbors anymore. But um, what do you think about it being being proactive in, in that? Um, I, I'm reminded of a scene from a movie. I don't even know if it ever came out. I saw like a pre-release or, or a uh, pre pre post uh, version of it where uh, there there was a guy and and he was a survivalist and he um, you know practiced the light discipline and nobody nobody had any idea that that he had a, a generator and and that he had electricity when everybody else didn't and all that. And he basically invited a couple of the neighbors over and gave them some of his food. 
And they asked him why he was doing that, and he said, because I don't have enough bullets for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as you know, Ed, from previous conversations we've had, I'm, I'm a strong advocate of community readiness and mm -hmm. getting your neighbors on board as best you can. Now, it's a catch-22. The more you talk to your neighbors about being prepared, the more they're going to realize you are prepared and, you know, you've got that kind of gnawing at the back of your mind. But I've always felt the more I can get other people to prepare, the less people I need to worry about knocking on my door. Right. Okay. I personally, I'm very fortunate where I live. Several of my neighbors are preppers. You know, we talk about the subjects regularly and I know that, you know, they're going to have my back just like I've got their back. And I, you know, I realize many, if not most, people don't have that luxury. But one of the, one of the few good things to come out of reality shows like uh, Survivor and Doomsday Preppers and things like that is it's brought the subject, the topic of preparedness into the mainstream. And it's not unusual, so to speak, for you to bring those topics up in casual conversation mm -hmm. and kind of gauge the, the impact that it's having on your friends, family, and neighbors. You know, shows like Doomsday Preppers are, are enormously popular for two reasons. You've got the people that like to poke fun at the preppers, and you've got the people that are looking at it going, well, you know, that guy might be a little outlandish, but... God, you know, it's probably not a bad idea if we kind of stock up on some food and water just in case this winter is really harsh, you know. So you can use those types of avenues to broach the topic with your neighbors and your family and your friends, and you're not going to necessarily be seen as the neighborhood kook anymore. Right. Yeah, I know. I, I struggle a little bit out where I live. I mean, I'm in a rural area, and it's a lot uh, it's a lot less densely populated. There are fewer people around, but uh, I'm pretty cagey when people ask me what I do for a living, and I tell them, oh, well, I uh, I, I do an online radio show, and ho hopefully it stays, <laughs> it doesn't go any further than that. Like, they don't ask me, any, oh, really, what's your show about? And they're like, well, it's about preparedness and survival and, and, and about, uh, I, I tend to lean more on the, um, uh, on the the liberty and and freedom and the uh, uh, the 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 consciousness aspects of the topics that I talk about, but you know when you tell them the, the title of the show, then you know then it, it starts engaging them in conversation, and more often than not, I, I find that you know my trepidation is unwarranted because uh, not well not everybody who lives in a rural area is is a prepper or is prepared or is has any kind of knowledge of survival or you know, uh, preparedness, and you would think that that would be the case, but it's more often the case not. But also, there's a the, most of the people that I talk to, it's not a it's not a foreign or bizarre topic for them anymore. So you right. do you have a point there because it's become it's become part of the vernacular uh, now. Thanks thanks and due in part uh, to to these shows, which I really have misgivings about. But but yeah, it's uh, well and. On top of that, too, the the topic of homesteading has become more and more popular as well. It's almost like a, a resurgence of the 60s and the Save the Planet campaigns and things like that where, you know, people want to be more green. So to do that, they're looking at ways that they can grow more of their own food instead of just buying it at the supermarket. Um, more and more communities are enacting ordinances allowing backyard chicken coops and things like that. And from my perspective, homesteading and prepping go hand in hand. Sure. You know, they're they're almost like two faces of the same coin. So as that becomes more popular, you can use that as well as a way to talk to your neighbors about being prepared. Absolutely. Now you haven't you have a section and, and this book would not be complete without a section on uh firearms 
and yeah. uh, and and weaponry. And are you prepared for the deluge of uh, conflicting opinions that are going to come through after this book has been out for a while? Oh, absolutely. You know, if, if there's one topic that can cause an argument with preppers faster than any other is what do you like for a firearm? Right. What's your, what do you think people should have? And my approach is now and has always been, you start with the basics and expand from there. Mm-hmm. You start with the 22 rim fire, the shotgun, the handgun, your uh, hunting rifle, and then you expand from there as your budget and your skills allow. You know, this is one area where many, many, many survivalists tend to overextend themselves. You know, I can't tell you how many of these people I've talked to or met that they'll go on and on and on and on about all the different black guns that they have, and they've got this, and they've got, you know, thousands of, on top of thousands of rounds. Well, how are you set with well, food storage? Oh, well, i got a case of these two. I should be okay. Right. I'm just going to go hunt everything I well, or, you and 10,000 other people. Or even worse, there's the uh, the contingency of folks who say, well, I'm I'm well armed, and so I'll just take whatever I need from the people around me. Exactly. I don't those people, they're not survivalists. No. They're dead on their feet. I, is I, what it is. Because they're I would gonna say, get shot. Yeah, I would say I would say worse than that. I would say that they're uh <laughs> they're scumbags. Uh P- anybody who yeah. thinks anybody who thinks that they're just gonna cat they're 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 gonna uh, take advantage of other people uh in a collapse situation and that's their plan. That I mean that is yeah. their, their conscious laid out plan. Uh yeah, they don't uh, they don't deserve to survive if if that's their no. philosophy. No, not at all. And I stay far away from those people. And you and me both, pal. So, uh, what about uh, bugging out? Uh, now, when when do you make the determination? And this is this is another hotly contested topic. Is when? Well, some people believe that yeah, you 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 bug out at the first sign of trouble. Other people, no, you stick and stick around as long as you can. What what what's your take on that? My take is you should remain at home or at your retreat until such time that that location becomes untenable, okay? And the reason I say that is, as preppers, we focus on stockpiling food, water, first aid, uh, all our gear and supplies. That's got to be put somewhere, and that somewhere is going to be your home or retreat. Why would you vacate unless you ask what they had to. Mm-hmm. That's where all of is. Nobody, despite what you see on TV, nobody can realistically bug out with a year's worth of food and take it. It's just not realistic. It's not going to happen. Right. If you're in a position where, for example, uh, you're out on the East Coast and uh, Superstorm Sandy is knocking on by all means, head west yeah. and, you know, shack up with a buddy of yours for a little while and wait for everything to settle down, okay? But if it's a collapse situation, that's where your stuff is. Mm-hmm. If you have to leave, fine. But until that time, do everything you can to stay with your stuff. That's what's going to keep you alive. Now, when it comes to bugging out, as we've talked before, if you don't have a plan of where you're going to go and how you're going to get there, you're nothing but a well-equipped refugee. Right. Okay. Bugging out with no destination in mind, to me, is just stupid. Okay. You should always have multiple places in mind where you can go to be safe, and you pick the location or you pick your destination based on why you're leaving and where you need to be. 
Absolutely. And and I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, as you and I have discussed in the past, you know, there's the, the lone wolf syndrome and the, the fantasy that, uh, yeah, if, uh, if the shit hits the fan, then I'm just going to strike out into the wilderness and live off the land. And that's uh, yeah. incredibly unrealistic. Well, Jim, I, exactly. I know you... Well, Jim, I know you're busy, and I know you got some other uh, you got some other places to be, and so and you got a full agenda. But I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to come on the show and let my listeners know about your book. And the book again, folks, is Preppers Home Defense, and you can find that at survivalandbeyond.net. It's right there in the the sidebar under our guest uh, our guest authors, our featured authors. And uh, I highly recommend picking it up. It's a great book. It's a. It really does fill a gap in the uh, in the survival and preparedness library. There's. N- I don't think there's any other uh, book out here, out there l- like it that's geared specifically for preppers and survivalists. Well, I appreciate you having me on, sir. It's been a blast. As always, same here. Thanks a lot, Jim. <laughs> Are you sick and tired of having your First Amendment harassed or censored on Facebook? Use no more as we now have a new alternative to Facebook. It's called Awareness Act. Awareness Act is a social network designed for patriots, to be used by patriots, and is ran by patriots. Stand up and help in the fight to protect your constitutional rights. Patriots can create pages, blogs, videos, documents, articles, and so much more. We even have a unique news feed system that allows you to share, read, or connect with any patriot on Awareness Act. We are a dedicated tool for patriots to use against the tyranny our Constitution is facing. So if you're tired of having your rights infringed upon, come check us out at www.awarenessact.com. Again, that is www.awarenessact.com, the social network for patriots, not potatoes. Whether you take me for the fool, I know that I can be. Whether you see me eye to eye, the new Be Prepared for Christmas package from Sun Ovens contains everything you need to harness the power of the sun for cooking, water, and dehydrating. The perfect gift for the preppers or outdoor enthusiasts on your shopping list. A Sun Oven uses the sun's power to bake, boil, or steam food, heat water for purification or personal hygiene, or solar dehydrate. When you use the sun's power on sunny days, you preserve your fuel storage for rainy days. Sun-baked foods retain moisture, have less shrinkage, and do not burn. Sun-baked roasts are tastier and more succulent, and sun-baked bread has unparalleled taste and texture. The new Be Prepared for Christmas package lets you roast an 18-pound turkey. For the past 26 years, Sun Ovens has been proudly made in the U.S., are durable, and have a long life and come with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Don't be fooled by cheap imitations. For a discount coupon, visit sunoven.com forward slash podcast. That's sunoven.com forward slash podcast. This is KPRN DB, broadcasting worldwide from Southeast Oklahoma, USA to parts unknown. <laughs> 